Hi, welcome back to The Basement. I'm Steve Lewis. Today we conclude our look at pop culture in the first quarter of 1972, the months of January, February, and March. There's a lot going on in this quarter. We've already talked about music and movies. This time we'll talk a little bit about what was going on in the news, of course what the Beach Boys were up to, but let's begin with television. On Tuesday, January 11th, the ABC Movie of the Week broadcast, The Night Stalker, starring Darren McGavin as cynical yet dedicated newspaper reporter Carl Kolchak on the trail of a real-life vampire stalking present-day Las Vegas. Possibly helped by the harsh winter weather and frigid temperatures keeping much of the country indoors that night, it became the highest-rated made-for-TV movie, drawing even more viewers than Duel and Brian's song had earlier in the season. Not surprisingly, given its phenomenal success, a novelization of the movie was released and a sequel was immediately planned. Three days later, on Friday the 14th, NBC premiered Sanford and Son, a new series developed by the same team who created All in the Family a year earlier, Norman Lear and Bud Yorkin. Like All in the Family, they had based it on an English series, this time Steptoe and Son. It starred Red Fox as Fred Sanford and Damon Wilson as his son Lamont. It rapidly became NBC's most highly rated series and a Friday night staple for years to come. Over on CBS, opposite Sanford and Son, the new Sonny and Cher Comedy Hour was also gaining a following. The show had been a summer replacement series in 1971 and became a permanent series mid-season beginning December 17, 1971. Both shows began drawing Friday night ratings away from ABC's The Brady Bunch and The Partridge Family. Just over a week later, on Saturday, January 22nd, NBC premiered producer Jack Webb's new series, Emergency, starring Kevin Ty and Randolph Mantooth as paramedics Gage and DeSoto of Los Angeles Firefighters Squad 51. The new series went up directly against the number one rated All in the Family, where it seemed unlikely to succeed. The show appealed to a different audience from All in the Family and eventually became the highest rated show among viewers aged 2 to 11. It would continue kicking off NBC's Saturday night lineup for its entire run, which would end in August 1977. I know at our house, Emergency was the show you watched when All in the Family broadcast a rerun. Then somewhere in the mid-70s, it flipped, and All in the Family became the show we watched when Emergency had a rerun. On daytime television, the Mike Douglas Show had long been a popular afternoon talk show featuring mostly mainstream celebrity guests promoting their new project or musical acts appealing to an older audience. It's the only place I remember seeing Duke Ellington and Ella Fitzgerald perform when I was a kid. Each week, Mike would welcome a co-host for that week. To give you an idea of Mike's typical co-hosts, in the first six weeks of 1972, they had been Sammy Davis Jr., Robert Wagner, comedian Toady Fields, Amanda Blake from Gunsmoke, and actors John Davidson and Elkie Summer. This should give you an idea of how unusual it was when, beginning Monday, February 14th, Mike's co-hosts for the week were John Lennon and Yoko Ono. It was an interesting attempt on John and Yoko's part to bring counterculture to the mainstream. As Yoko put it at the time, the Mike Douglas show communicates more with the older generation. We wanted to reach our hands out and say to them, don't be afraid of us, and we shouldn't be hostile to you either. They were patient and charming, and also firm in their positions. Mike Douglas was an unfailingly genial host, even when things got a little bizarre and kooky, such as when Yoko reconstructed a broken teacup over the course of the week, and when composer David Rosenblum hooked John and Yoko up to a biofeedback machine and ran it through a synthesizer. There were some pretty good musical performances from John with Yoko and members of the Elephant's Memory Band, and over the course of the week, guests ranged from the Chambers Brothers to consumer protection advocate Ralph Nader, comic actor Louis Nye, Black Panther leader Bobby Seale, and George Carlin, among others. During one of the shows, John, Yoko, and their band were joined by guest Chuck Berry for an off-kilter jam on Berry's Memphis, Tennessee and Johnny B. Good, which wasn't helped by Yoko's avant-garde vocalizing. I always thought it would have been great if in the middle of that vocalizing, going, ah! that Yoko had stepped up to the microphone and gone, Okay, everybody! <laughs> At the end of the month, Lennon's non-immigrant U.S. visa would expire. On March 6th, his visa extension, granted only five days earlier, 
would be abruptly canceled and deportation proceedings would be started against him. Lenin would file appeals to remain in the country. Soon he was publicly claiming that the deportation was politically motivated. To a lot of people, even to a lot of Lenin's fans in 1972, this seemed like the delusions of an egomaniac. It seemed ridiculous that President Nixon would concern himself with a pop star, let alone misuse the Immigration and Naturalization Services to go after someone he considered an enemy. Getting back to television, on Saturday, February 19th, we got the memorable Sammy's Visit episode of All in the Family. Having Sammy Davis Jr. drop by the Bunker household was a plot much more suited to Here's Lucy than All in the Family, and there had been some resistance to the idea from the writers and producers. They came up with a fairly unobjectionable rationale of having Davis leave a briefcase in a taxi driven by Archie, who was moonlighting as a cab driver to pick up some extra cash. Davis agrees to come by the Bunker house to pick it up, since it's on his way to the airport. It was still a bit of a stretch, but the episode was well-written and funny, and became one of the most watched and well-remembered of the series. Over on NBC, the NBC Mystery Movie had premiered in the fall of 1971 with a revolving roster of programs. There was McLeod, starring Dennis Weaver, McMillan and Wife, starring Rock Hudson and Susan St. James, and Peter Falk as Columbo. Each of the shows was pretty popular. By early 72, Columbo, a brilliant detective who disarmed and outwitted criminals by appearing dim and befuddled himself, had broken away from the pack and was becoming something of a popular phenomenon. At bookstores and newsstands, the hot new fiction title was Herman Woke's The Winds of War, historical fiction set in World War II. It would spend 21 of 26 weeks at number one on the New York Times bestseller list in the first half of 1972. Hitting the newsstands around this time was the April 1972 issue of Cosmopolitan Magazine, featuring what was billed as the first male nude centerfold. Editor-in-chief Helen Gurley Brown called it a milestone in the the sexual revolution. Actor Burt Reynolds was the subject of the photo shoot and was carefully posed not to reveal too much. Even though the photo was pretty tame, it was enough to cause some controversy, a lot of notoriety, and a lot of punchlines on TV. Meanwhile, back on the weekend of January 21st through 23rd, a group of fans of the defunct TV series Star Trek held a convention in New York where they rented a ballroom at the Statler Hilton Hotel and hoped that it might possibly draw a few hundred fans. Star Trek had been canceled in 1969 and had never had high Nielsen ratings during its three-year run. It had been popular in syndicated reruns in the years that followed, but to most people, it seemed ridiculous that anybody would attend a convention for a defunct TV show. It seemed even crazier and much more notable when the event reportedly drew 3,000 attendees over the course of the weekend and the organizers decided to turn it into an annual event. From February 21st through the 28th, President Nixon visited the People's Republic of China in a historic and important overture to resuming and normalizing relationships between the two countries. It was the first time the American public had seen coverage from inside China in more than 20 years. Though it's hard to appreciate now, at the time, going to China was just short of going to the moon as an exotic locale. While Nixon was looking statesmanlike in China, the Democrats were gearing up for their primaries in advance of the fall presidential election. Presumed frontrunner Maine Senator Edmund Muskie's campaign suffered a series of setbacks. Though Muskie still won the early primary in New Hampshire on March 7th, he did it by a much smaller margin than expected. South Dakota Senator George McGovern came in a surprisingly strong second. With Muskie's campaign seeming to fade, there was soon a constellation of prospective Democratic candidates vying for the nomination with, for the moment, no clear frontrunner. On February 28th, trial began for former UCLA professor and political activist Angela Davis, who had been charged with murder, kidnapping, and conspiracy related to a 1970 terrorist attack on a Marin County courtroom in which a judge was killed. Davis wasn't present when the crimes were committed, and her only demonstrable connection was that she owned the guns that had been used. She was a controversial figure, and many thought that the prosecution for murder, kidnapping, and conspiracy was politically motivated. It's a very complex story, too complex to really get into here, but she deserves a mention because she was very much discussed in early 1972, and 
both John Lennon and the Rolling Stones would feature songs about Davis on their 1972 albums. Angela Davis's trial would finally conclude on June 4th. After only 13 hours of deliberation, the jury found her not guilty on all counts. On March 2nd, the unmanned Pioneer 10 space probe is launched for the first mission to the planet Jupiter. On July 15th, it'll begin crossing the asteroid belt on its way toward a rendezvous with Jupiter in November 1973. In 1983, it'll become the first man-made object to leave the solar system. The mission will officially end in 1997. Amazingly, Pioneer 10 will continue transmitting data until 2003 when it's reached 7.5 billion miles from Earth. As for our old friends the Beach Boys, they did a little bit of recording early in the year. On January 31st, Brian, working primarily with Carl, put together a track for a song he'd been calling Beatrice from Baltimore. On February 17th, Brian, again working with Carl and a few others, recorded a track for a song he'd provisionally titled One Arm Over My Shoulder. It was now retitled Marcella. In late February, the touring group traveled to Holland where they appeared on the TV show Top Pop, lip-syncing to the new unreleased Marcella. On February 26th, they appear live at the annual Grand Gala du Disque Populaire show in Amsterdam, performing Heroes and Villains, Sloop John B., Surf's Up, and Student Demonstration Time, which had been released as a single in Holland and gone to number 21. The Beach Boys spent some time relaxing in Holland and soon decided to use it as a base for their upcoming European tour. Reportedly, at the urging of manager Jack Riley and Carl, they also decide to record in Holland, feeling that the change of scene from California will do them good. By the end of February, there are two new members of the Beach Boys, when former Flames members Blondie Chaplin and Ricky Fattar joined the band. Interestingly, it seems that Jack Riley asked Ricky to join, and it was Carl who approached Blondie about joining the group. The advantages are obvious. With Dennis unable to drum due to a hand injury, a new drummer is needed. Both Blondie and Ricky are great players and great singers, and they bring a new power to the band. On March 16th at New York University in Albany, the new lineup of the Beach Boys makes its official live debut. The set includes a medley of the Beach Boys' Wonderful with the Flames' Don't Worry Bill from their 1971 album. The group will continue touring through April 2nd. Looking back on it in retrospect, though no one would have known it at the time, this would have been, I think, a prime time to see the group at a time when there were eight Beach Boys, seven of them on stage, with Ricky, Blondie, and Bruce all in the lineup. By March, they've also realized that their plan to record in Holland is going to be a little bit more complicated and a little bit more expensive than they had originally thought. There are few suitable recording studios in Holland, and those that there are are already booked far in advance, and housing is in short supply. Nevertheless, they decide to forge ahead, moving equipment from California to Holland and building their own studio. That'll bring us to the end of the first quarter of 1972. Hope you've enjoyed this. Please let me know through the comments section. Please let me know also if there's something from this first three months of the year that I've left out that I really should have mentioned. We'll move on next time to the second quarter, the months of April, May, and June. Then we will talk about the Carl and the Passions album that came out on May 15th of 72. Please hit like and subscribe. I always appreciate that. Look forward to your comments, and we will see you next time. Thanks for watching. Bye.